From the city to rural North America, this is Rural America Live, connecting the people who grow America's food and fiber with those who enjoy it. Call in, let's talk. It's Rural America Live. Risk is involved in almost every element of agriculture. The CME Group in Chicago offers a vehicle for farmers and ranchers and farm families to manage that risk. A year ago, the CME Group teamed up with 4-H and offered a game at county and state fairs called Commodity Carnival. Tonight on Rural America Live, we'll explain how that game is played. We'll meet the man who developed it, and we'll also meet representatives from the CME Group and 4-H as Commodity Carnival now begins year number two. Good evening, I'm Mark Oppold. Welcome to Rural America Live. Thank you so much for joining us. Joining me in studio tonight, Tim Andreessen, CME Group Managing Director, Agricultural Products, and also Dr. Dorothy Freeman, Associate Dean and 4-H Director, University of Minnesota Extension. Welcome to our program, both of you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mark. Good to have you here. And later on, by the way, we'll be joined by Dr. Paul Kuber from the Ohio State University, the developer of Commodity Carnival. Before we get too much further, into the program. Uh, Tim, you first of all, uh, by the way, a great partnership with CME Group and RFD TV and XM, uh, Sirius XM uh, Channel 80 Rural Radio. I uh, really thank you for, and your people are great to work with and a great service to our listeners and viewers as they manage their risk. So a good, a good partnership and good to have you here. Well, it's great to be here and, and we really do um, appreciate your listeners and your viewers. They're our core customers. They're the, the purpose for CME being Right. A little bit about yourself and your background. Uh, from Illinois originally? I'm from East Central Illinois. Grew up just north of Champaign. Wasn't in agriculture. Went mm. off to college and uh, after I graduated, got a job as a merchandiser for a grain company in Southern Illinois. So I bought corn from farmers, traded grain, worked in places like Monticello, Illinois, Decatur, Illinois, Wichita, Kansas, Davenport, Iowa, all in the grain business. Um, toward the end of the uh, 90s, I ended up going to New York and actually working for some banks that were very involved in agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, spent some time in Sydney, Australia, working for an Australian bank, mm -hmm. and I joined CME Group uh, five years ago to run the ag business. And I know you and I have talked before at the Farm Broadcasters Convention, for one. You're very excited about this first year now behind you, but Car Commodity Carnival, a lot to offer, not just the young people, but a great, great message. So. I think it's fantastic, and, and we're really happy to be here to talk to your viewers Very about Very good. It. Good to have you here. Dr. Freeman, uh, nice to have gotten to know you earlier today. Share your background with our listeners and viewers. Yes, we as well in 4-H are excited to be here this evening to talk about the relationship that we have with the CME Group. Mm -hmm. I bring 37 years of experience in working with 4-H. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. My yeah. first 25 years were with Virginia, where I worked at Virginia Tech, and the last 12 years have been at the University of Minnesota, mm -hmm. where I have led the 4-H program. And you've seen a lot of changes, a lot of reaction. We're going to talk about that from the young people who have played this game, and it just gets better and better, doesn't it? I it does get better and better, and I was excited last year that we were involved in it, and I'm excited again that we will be engaged with it again this year. Very good. Look forward to hearing more about that. And again, we'll be uh, meeting uh, Dr. Paul Kuber from The Ohio State University, the developer of the game, and we'll show you how it's played. And we'll be opening our telephone lines, by the way. As always, this is uh, Rural America Live, and you're a very important part. As we open our telephone lines, we look forward to hearing from you, maybe about risk management, maybe about foray. Uh, a youngster that is not a member right now that might want to be. Uh, hopefully we'll hear from you as well. And as we get started here, uh, Tim, let's start out by talking about, wow, what a rich history. As a farm broadcaster, I'm well aware of the history, but share that with our listeners and viewers, the history, the mission of the CME Group. Yeah, so a lot of people don't, when you say CME Group, don't recognize it as well as the Chicago Board of Trade or the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Good point. Uh, those are the two organizations that joined to form what the CME Group is today. We then added the, the NYMEX, which is an energy exchange, the COMEX, which is a metals exchange. We have relationships globally with other important agricultural exchanges. Um, our primary focus is to offer risk management products, exchange-traded risk management products in the form of futures contracts and options contracts where our customers can come to manage their risk. Mm -hmm. um, we think that's a very, very important thing to do, uh, and we'll talk a lot about that tonight, uh, but having a venue to be able to manage that risk, 
to effectively um, see where the prices are and, and use those prices is, is really, really important mm -hmm. to us. The price discovery mechanism, that's where it's always been. Uh, when you talk about price discovery of the different commodities, Chicago has been there for hundred, over 100 years. And it's, you know, there's been a lot of changes going on. It's, it's grown very, very global. I was in Brazil last week uh, talking to customers, you know, we travel the world mm -hmm. where, you know, producers, and incidentally producers, everywhere you go have the same kind of concerns. But, uh, you know, where, where we go, we have a lot of producers who are always looking at that price and are always trying to think about how the markets work and how to manage the mm -hmm. risk around their business. And again, those of you listening and viewing, if you have a question for Tim, uh, whatever it might be, we look forward to hearing from you when we open our telephone lines a bit later. Same question to you, Dr. Freeman, as far as 4-H, the, the, the history there. I was a 4-H member. In fact, I, was a, I, would, I didn't share this with you earlier. I was my first officer's position was a reporter. And I was I wrote the, the notes for our local paper, and that's kind of where my journalism career really started. I really enjoyed that. I like to see my name in the paper too. But. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking that Voyage has served you well. It helped you with your career aspirations. It sure, sure has. Let's, so talk about the history and, and your mission of 4-H. 4-H is the largest youth development organization of this nation. It serves about seven million young people. Wow. But what 4-H is about is basically found in its pledge. It says, I pledge my head to clearer thinking, and that's about cognitive development and helping young people to learn to think. Mm -hmm. I pledge my heart to greater loyalty, and that's about social emotional development and helping young people to learn to interact with people different than themselves. And the third H says, I pledge my health to better living, my, I pledge my hands to larger service. See, I mess it up when I get in public. My hands to larger service, which is about vocational and technical development and helping young people find something of passion where they can learn a skill like you did mm -hmm. in, in broadcasting and where you can have a career around it. And then the fourth H is about I pledge my health to better living. And that's about spiritual and emotional and physical health where they are holistic person and well-grounded. But it's not for themselves. In Minnesota, we say, for my family, and then for my club, for my community, for my country, and my world. So it really is about helping young people learn their skills and being the best that they could possibly be, mm -hmm. and learn something of passion where they can give back to their communities and be of service. By the way, thanks for not asking me to do that pledge. I don't know if I'd have done that either. <laughs> Either, uh, but something we talked about earlier before we get any further is that the the urban outreach has just been outstanding here in your recent history. Yes, most people would think that 4-H is very rural, mm -hmm. but many of our young people are urban young people in which we do all kinds of programs with them. We do robotics, we do gardening, we have nutrition, photography, dance. We actually have an aggressive movement to engage diverse young people, and especially urban young people, in our program. Mm -hmm. Because if we are going to feed the world, Amen. our urban community need to understand the value of agriculture as well. Well, well said. We could stop right there and be a great program, wouldn't it, Tim? I mean, that's the message to feed the world. But, you, but there's a risk involved in producing that food. Let's talk about the CME group again, we, because this game is all about managing risk and, and, and understanding that at a, at a young age. So who's involved at the CME group? In terms of this project, in, in, in the, the in no, risk as far management. as risk management, the players at the CME group, the, those people who are buying and selling. You know, to to have an effective risk management environment, it takes a lot of different market participants. Um, you know, if you think of the people that have commodity price risk, it's through the whole food value chain. You know, on one hand, you have the producer who is either, you know, feeding animals or growing grains or or producing the core product. It moves through a value chain where you have country elevators who are providing risk management tools and forward contracting tools to processors, whether they're processing you know, corn into meat or, or corn into ethanol, all the way through the food chain to the end user, to the, the food company that is trying to hedge the, the, the wheat that they're going to make bread with. Mm -hmm. So you have a complete full value chain of people that all have this risk. And being able to manage that risk has a significant impact on the cost of that food that's produced. There's also an ecosystem around that of having 
people to whom you can transfer risk. People talk a lot about speculators. But you have to understand that if you have want to have risk transfer, you have to have somebody who's willing to take on that risk. And so part of the market are those people who are willing to take on that risk to try to make money. They don't always do. Sometimes they lose money. But to uh, allow the producer to move the risk from his operation, which is focused on producing, to somebody else. All right. And then you get into the, the, the game we're going to talk about, the commodity carnival, uh, and, and just maybe sharing thoughts, uh, the CME's thought process in education and how this worked in. You know, I, I spent a lot of time working with producers in the early years of my yes, career. Just, uh -huh. And a lot of those producers are very, very focused on production, okay, hence the name producer. They're not as focused on risk management. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, the younger generation are the people that are embracing rich man risk management much more in their operation. Our view is the sooner that people understand it, even, you know, kids in this the 7 to 14-year-old age that we're targeting, the more they understand risk management, the more it's going to be ingrained in people's business and how they think about the business. Uh, we see it as two wins. Number one, we're targeting them, but we also see these fantastic kids from 4-H that are getting involved in this. And we see them as the, the leaders that are going to help bring risk management more and more to the farm. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Freeman, he's already kind of answered my next question. The natural Oops, one to you. No, no. <laughs> the natural one to you is why 4-H embraced this quickly and immediately to get involved with CME Group. Why did 4-H, why did in your words, do that? Well, boy, several reasons. 4-H has a long history with agriculture, mm -hmm. and we understand agriculture, and we've been engaged in multiple products with agriculture. As well, in North Central Region, the North Central Program leaders um, basically discovered that we have a lot of companies in the North Central Region who, don't, who do not have a workforce readily available for them, and we felt that we could help feed the pipeline of help young people understand the science of agriculture and that they would see the interests of that and want to become a part of the pipeline. We have a lot of companies in North Central that we believe that we could help with that. In addition, 4-H is about helping young people be young leaders. Mm -hmm. And this model looks very much like 4-H, in which we have young people serving as teens, as teachers in here. And they are teaching other young people as well as adults. And adults tend to stop and listen to other young people when they're teaching. So when these teenagers are teaching, adults are learning as well. And young people are looking up to those teenagers as they do the teaching. Mm -hmm. We met one of those that uh, you brought with you uh, from one of our uh, parties here that, and with us on our program from, I believe, from Ohio State Ohio. University. Mm -hmm. That's been part of the uh, team putting us together. So we'll be talking about those kinds of people as we uh, work through this hour. We're going to take our first break right now. And when we come back, more about the CME Group and the 4-H uh, announcement here and their partnership in 2014. And and you're going to see the game and meet the man who developed Commodity Carnival. But first, a very special message from Terry Duffy. Mr. Duffy is CME Group Executive Chairman and President. Ties to agriculture have gone back since the inception of our business. And it's extremely important that we believe that the uh, farmers and ranchers of our country have an opportunity to do their risk management in the most cost-effective way in the deepest pools of liquidity, and that's exactly what CME Group provides. When you look at the partnership, it's helped CME achieve multiple different things, but what's most important, it's not done yet. There's a long way to go with this partnership. We need to continue on if we're going to have a success rate that we envision in this partnership. So it's not a one and done with CME and the 4-H. We're in for the long run. For us to be at the actual fairs, in my opinion, is important. So some people can write a check. That's an easy thing to do, to show up and participate and be part of the process. That's really priceless. What we do is very, very complex and some would say arcane. So you have to start at some level. And the level of the commodity carnival is really great for the young people to get an atmosphere of how risk management works. Last year was really important for me to go back to Illinois State Fair and buy the Champion Barrow for a lot of reasons. I used to spend a lot of years down at the State Fair when I was younger. I really enjoy the atmosphere. I love to see the kids, you know, raise these animals. You know, you know we see the finished product when you get to the State Fair, but you, what these kids have gone through to bring these animals to the, where they're at today is truly remarkable. It's really the kids that should be commended.
And welcome back to World America Live. I'm Mark Oppel, joined by our friends at the CME Group and 4-H. And we're talking about their partnership focusing on risk management, education. We're joined by Tim Andreessen, CME Group Managing Director of Agricultural Products, Dr. Dorothy Freeman, Associate Dean, uh, State 4-H Director, University of Minnesota Extension, and now joined uh, for the first time, Dr. Paul Cooper. He is Associate Professor and Extension Specialist, 4-H Youth Development, Livestock Animal Programs at Ohio State University. It takes two cards to put all that on there, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it does, Mark. Doctor, uh, welcome. It's been great to get to know you today as well. And uh, before we get too far, your your background is Ohio home for you? No, um, I actually grew up in California in the West Coast and uh, was involved in youth livestock programs, uh, much like a lot of the kids that are involved in helping to deliver this program to uh, youth um, that maybe don't have an agricultural background. I graduated from Cal State University, Fresno, uh, did a master's degree at University of Nebraska in animal science. Um, I've got a strong background in that. Mm -hmm. uh, my area of expertise or, or interest at that time was meat science. Uh, I actually went out and worked in industry for about five years with uh, Superior Farms, a lamb company. Spent two of those years in Australia. Um, decided to come back for a PhD because I'm interested in academic programs. I've always believed in youth programs such as 4-H and uh, thought this was a great opportunity to be able to give back. After my PhD, I had an opportunity to come to The Ohio State University and have been there for 10 years uh, as a livestock ex extension specialist. and it's it's, it's been a great ride. Wow, that's a great tour of the country and Australia. Uh, Tim was telling us and spent some time in Australia as well. Uh, before we go, we were sitting around the table getting ready today, and, and uh, Tim said, Mark, you have to ask Dr. Paul. He <laughs> teaches a class that you won't believe at The Ohio State University. But share that with our listeners and viewers. You may have some new students coming to Columbus, Ohio. <laughs> well, we've, uh, we've got an opportunity to uh, be able to expand our curriculum at Ohio State and uh, looking for opportunities to be able to bring in students from other disciplines and so we thought uh, what better than a cooking class and so it's actually a barbecue science class that we teach there at the university. We've been teaching it for about four semesters. Um, it's a, a great opportunity to teach them the science behind barbecue and there is quite a bit of science behind that uh, but then also be able to uh, share and, and interact with the students as they learn and they discover uh, new talents that they may have that they can share with family and friends uh, down the road. Right and someone asked well how do you what's your final exam look like in a, in a barbecue Barbecue science class. <laughs> well, we have uh, we have a team competition, so it's not much different than a lot of the reality TV shows where they uh, compete <laughs> against one another, and the students are given certain products that they have to prepare, and the teams uh, are challenged in uh, developing the recipes, showing us the cook time and and uh, the proper preparation, as well as food safety. That's certainly an important aspect to make sure that. Uh, that they're cooking the right product at the right temperature wow. so that it's done and it's safe to consume for their uh, for their guests mm -hmm. or their friends. I imagine you don't have very much absenteeism in that class. but <laughs> No, <laughs> not on the lab day, not on the lab day. <laughs> All right, so you are here, we're putting a face with the person who developed the game that's so helpful and uh, the CME group got behind, 4-H is very excited, Dr. Freeman talking about that. Uh, how did it all start? Could take us back to the beginning and, and from your perspective at Ohio State. Okay. This was a competition, by the way, I would add to viewers and listeners. It, you just didn't walk into this. There, was, there were other universities competing for whatever this game was going to look like at the end. Right, and, uh, and, the, and the game was actually put together as a team effort. Um, it, it initiated by Dr. Bob, Hart, Bob Horton, who is our um, state 4-H uh, STEM specialist, science, technology, engineering, math specialist. Uh, Dr. Horton actually received the funding from National 4-H, um, which allowed him to uh, put together a committee or a team to uh, develop the activity. Uh, when it came to my table, um, it actually came there as a result of my, uh, my expertise in livestock programs and animal science programs. And so um, I jumped on board. I was able to uh, bring that information uh, from not only just a fun game, but to make sure it's technically correct and accurate mm -hmm. uh, in terms of livestock information and uh, that we were also meeting the expectations of the CME group as well. Now, so how does it actually work when you get to a county fair or a state fair? Just going to walk us through. We're going to see some of that, but uh, what happens at the fair uh, when this game is played? Well, um, the uh, the game itself, I think there's a great opportunity to, um, one, we can draw the students in or the youth in uh, based off of the carnival activity, in essence. And it's, you know, it's a fun game. It's something that's visually appealing. It's something that uh, they can certainly be active in. But I think the, 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 the greater reaching um, aspect of this 
this is that we're actually teaching young consumers about animal agriculture. Mm -hmm. We're teaching them about the food industry, and I think that's a critically important thing. I think we wait too long in a consumer's um, you know educational process to deliver that information, particularly from agriculture. Uh, we we've had a tendency on a lot of issues in agriculture to turn the other cheek and think that it's going to die down, or the you know the aspect, or the uh, you know maybe the antagonism from certain groups is going to die down. But uh, I think if we start teaching consumers early on so that they learn the educational process about how you raise animals, what potential risks come into that, that uh, they start to understand that farmers, just like any other business, they run risk, they have challenges that they face, and, and uh, certainly, um, you know, the, the, the end line is they want to be able to make a profit so that they can mm -hmm. have a livelihood. Dr. Freeman and Tim both have shared those same thoughts about uh, agriculture and getting these young people involved at a very young age and uh, talking about where the food comes from, number one, and the risks involved in getting that food produced from the farm to the table. So, right. all right, it's called a Commodity Carnival. The gentleman who developed it from Ohio State University joining us. Let's take a quick look video-wise at how the game actually works by those who play it. My involvement with 4-H truly started when I was two years old when I went to the DuPage County Fair for the first time, but I wasn't an active member until I was eight years old, and then my last year showing was when I was 19. This summer, I'm being the intern for the University of Illinois State Extension Office and working alongside with the National 4-H Council and the CME group with the Commodity Carnival. Uh, with kids that come into the Commodity Carnival, there's a lot of different things they, they will learn. They're going to be learning about the different costs that a farmer may go through raising a, a steer from point A to point B, such as feed costs with the grain and soybeans they'll be feeding to their steers, uh, vet bills just in case an animal happens to get sick, transportation costs, energy costs, and things like that, as well as just be able to gain more knowledge about the actual market side of raising livestock as well. But the big thing that I think kids are going to be able to take away through the Commodity Carnival it's just a better understanding of where the food actually comes from and the different uh, steps a farmer has to go through to take that animal from uh, farm to table. Anything that's hands-on like this that teaches them about agriculture and something as fun as this game can definitely spark an interest and be um, a good asset to the 4-H program. Like, I would definitely check out the Commodity Carnival booth. It's a great opportunity to play a game and learn more about the ag industry. I'm one of five different 4-H interns that are going to be in charge of overseeing the Commodity Carnival, but we're also going to be in 11 different states this year and 120 different county and state fairs throughout the country. So it'll be something that everyone, not only in the state of Illinois, can come and experience. <laughs> All right. Well, it looks fun, and it is fun, and youngsters around the country will be playing the Commodity Carnival. Doctor, I want to stay with you. Uh, we've seen that video. I want to come down and get your comments, too, Dr. Freeman and Tim. Uh, just a little bit about the game itself and some of the things you've experienced. It must, be, it must give you a good feeling that developing it and then seeing it come to fruition. Yeah, being, being involved in the development and uh, um, actually see it act out is, is um, uh, you know, certainly a good feeling. And I think last year when we had the initial uh, installment of it, it was a great opportunity to be able to not only see the activity working, but that we had so many youth wanting to participate in it. Mm -hmm. And I think this year it's going to be even better in terms of, uh, you know, what we've got as far as marketables and, and the materials um, that the youth will be able to come by. And Dorothy, we saw some of those at the very end of the video, some of the youngsters is wearing these hats. Uh, this this hat right here, you have one next to you. Uh, let's talk about that. Everyone who plays the game is going to be walking around the fairgrounds with a very special hat. Yes, they will. And in the Minnesota State Fair, this is going to be a hot item. <laughs> uh, at that fair, you see all kinds of opportunities, that uh, things that people have passion around. This will be exciting because everyone will want to get one. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what you see on people's heads, but what's important <laughs> here is the message that is delivery and will make people want to come and find the carnival and participate because they are going to want to get one of the hats. So this will entice them in 
to come and actually do the game so that they too can get the hats. The difficulty will be is that the parents will want those hats as well. You think? So they will have to do the games yeah. too. <laughs> now, Doctor, back to you real quick before Tim. Uh, these are the obviously uh, uh, cows here, beef animals. Last right. year, in year one, you were in the pork industry, if I, if right. I remember. Right. You, you made a change this year, that's why, and you're focusing on the beef industry this year. Right, that was uh, um, the CME group had, had requested that we try and produce the same or a similar game with modifications that would fit the beef industry. And uh, I believe uh, Tim yeah, is 25 years um, with. We, we've offered um, live cattle futures for 25 right. years. This is the anniversary. Oh, is that and right? So that's why we're, yeah, that's why we chose to do beef. No, good. I'm sorry, it's actually been 50 years. I was going to say, it's, uh, I've been in broadcasting more than 25 years. Yeah, it's 50 years. years. <laughs> I was reporting live cattle futures from day one. Um, so, and and Tim, the, uh, the those folks, uh, I say folks, the young men and women who are helping at these county fairs, state fairs around the country, we're going to be show the map here in a minute, uh, have uniforms. You'll, they'll be able to easily pick out, you talk about hats, uh, they have their hat and shirt that they'll be wearing as well. As you saw in the video, we have these, uh, these commodity carnival shirts for for, uh, for all the kids there. We have hats for all the kids there. We all know how people like hats. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure which is going to be the hotter <laughs> of these I think two. it will be the, this one right here. Yeah, right. And then we have these little squeezable um, cows as well that uh, you know are, are part of the prize. Everybody that plays is going to walk away with something because we don't want anybody to do this and not walk away with something. Sure. So the cow, that, but they, uh, that kind of a grand prize, is that right? Or There's ribbons, there's, uh, there's these, there's uh, all sorts of stuff. All right, and now it comes the time for you to join the conversation. You have questions about Commodity Carnival and maybe uh, where we're going to be. We're going to show you that in just a moment, but our questions about risk management. Telephone lines are open right now. We look forward to hearing from you at 877-731-6733. Again, toll free, lines open, 877-731-6733. We look forward to hearing from you. Dr. Freeman, uh, and we talk about these uniforms, the hats that they're going, the workers are going, I call them workers, are going to wear. Uh, talk about the importance of 4-H te uh, teens and leading these uh, teams and, these, and the volunteers at the fair. Thank you for that question. It is age appropriate. 4-H tries to design its programs based on age and what is appropriate for that age. Mm -hmm. When young people become teenagers, it becomes very important for them to teach knowledge to other young people. So as part of the youth development process for us is that we engage them in a way that they learn deeply in a, in a content area that they are interested in, as well as impart knowledge to other young people. In addition, 4-H is very interested in helping young people learn the content so that they can explore the possibility of careers mm -hmm. and learn about how commodities actually operate, learn about Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and learn about other parts of the industry so that they can see that as a career potential. Mm -hmm. And Tim, the one thing we didn't cover that's pretty obviously visible on the board, uh, maybe walk us through here. We see these pails uh, and they have different names on them. And Dr. Paul, you may want to chime in here too. These are the different inputs, the costs that they're looking at here? Uh, yes, it is. What, what they're essentially doing is making production decisions around their animal. They're deciding um, how much do we put in terms of feed, how much do we put in terms of uh, medicine, other nutritional products, and then um, I'm not going to cut to, I'll let you go through how the game works, but you know, just like any other producer, they have to make those economic decisions before um, they get to the point where they've produce something and market something. Mm -hmm. So doctor, they take those, they have those, the, there are four pails, mm -hmm. uh, the, am I right yep. in that? And, yep. and maybe just how are they labeled besides feed costs? Well, the feed costs, that's the highest input that you have in livestock production. And so we have to make that as one of the main staples. That's the bigger pail. That's why it's the bigger bucket. And then we've got the three smaller buckets um, and the risk factor, we, we know that you're gonna have certain medications that you have to purchase to be able to keep an animal on a maintenance health schedule. 
Um, you may have a disease outbreak, something else that occurs that's going to actually elevate those costs. And so sometimes your risk is going to rise in terms of that. You may have facility repairs that you have to do because you may have had a storm come through your operations. So you're, you're going to have added cost as, as far as that's concerned. So what basically happens is when you get to the end, you've got a break even price that's set based off of weight of the animal. If you've got more inputs, you've got more risk that maybe has um, slowed the animal's growth down, you don't have as much weight at the end of the of the end of the project, then what's going to occur is that you're going to end up with a higher break-even price because you don't have uh, a heavier animal that's going to have more product to be able to sell mm -hmm. and recoup some of that cost. And then we saw, what, to me, I'm going to call it that, that Plinko board. Yep. Is that kind of the grand finale once you've made these decisions? It is. Um, all the, uh, with, with the CME group, they, they price everything on a 100-weight basis. So on the bottom of that board, we actually have 100-weight um, prices on the bottom of that board. Mm -hmm. The animals, when they go through the, uh, the activity or the students fill up the eggs, they get the weight of the egg, and that gives them a break-even price. And when they have that break-even price, um, if they have a heavyweight animal, their break-even price basically means that there's one spot on that board that they're going to lose money, one spot that they'll break even, and three spot, spots that they could actually make a profit. If they have the highest break-even price with the lightest animal or the lightest egg in this uh, activity, then they're going to have one place for a profit, one place for break-even, and three places for loss. And so what we're trying to show them is that if you have lighter weight animals relative to the way this activity is set up, that uh, if everything else is equal, you know, the same time on feed, the same age of the animal, if they're lighter weight, they cost more to produce, and so they're not going to be able to make a profit mm -hmm. as easily. They still could make a profit if it's in a good year, but they may not make it as easily. I understand. All right. Well, learning more about that ourselves, and our toll-free lines are open for you to join our conversation here. Commodity Carnival, year number two, uh, underway very soon, and lines are open for you, and perhaps talking about the CME Group and some of the services and risk management, taking risk away from your operation and letting someone else assume that risk, and you do what you do best, produce the product. Our toll-free lines are open, 877 877- 731-6733, 877-731-6733, whether you're watching RFD TV or listening on Sirius XM Channel 80, we welcome your calls. And how does this, Doctor, back to you real quick, any change that you, this is year two, a lot of times the biggest change is from year one to year two, and then the, the changes are a little more gradual from there, but uh, what's different this year that people say, oh, I played that last year, so I don't need to play it this year? Well, I think um, there's there's a couple of things. Uh, the, the base activity is the same. Um, we actually have uh, products and items, I think, that are visually more appealing. So to try and draw in the uh, uh, participants into that activity. Um, the other thing is that we've actually used a beef model instead of a pork model. Um, and again, we talked about that. Tim mentioned why we, we chose to do that this year. Mm -hmm. uh, we took the board from having seven price structures on the bottom to five price structures, so we simplified that. We also modernized the board a little bit, so graphically it looks a little bit more appealing. So again, getting back to that graphic piece. And um, I think uh, in terms of the inputs, we actually aligned them uh, so that we, we're using glass beads versus, I think last year the way we had the activity set up is that you purchase sticky notes. We crumpled those up and put them into a, into a bucket. It wasn't as appealing. I mean, it worked fine. <laughs> yeah. It took up space in the egg, but it wasn't as appealing. So we tried to make it a little bit more visit, you know, aesthetically pleasing, I guess, to the yeah. eye from that perspective. You know, Mark, what's amazing about this is that, as he explains that, there's all sorts of science behind this. There's all sorts of economics behind this. But when you watch these kids, all of these lessons are being taught in a very simple, fun way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you go to the fair, you watch these kids do this, and I don't really... You know, I don't really think they understand how much they're learning yeah, maybe as so. they're playing this game. Right. And that's the brilliance of this, is these kids are enjoying this, and they're learning at the same time. I think, I think the Ohio State University has done a great job in terms of coming up with this design. Well, people are going to ask, well, okay, where, I want to play the game. I want to play the game. Where is it going to be this summer? And uh, you've got the, the, uh, the, the plots are laid out uh, as far as the map is concerned. Let's talk about that a little bit, Tim, where they can go. Um, I think we got a map we're going to put up here. Uh, there we go. Um, these are the states that we're going to be in. We're going to be in 11 states. We're going to be at 120 fairs, some of them state fairs, some of them county fairs. Mm -hmm. 
And those of you listening on Sirius XM, it'd be the, basically that uh, what we call the North Central region, uh, Minnesota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and Texas in there too. In fact, Dorothy, you uh, made a comment that, Mark, this is really uh, the heart of the North Central region of 4-H, and there's a good reason for that. Yes, our dean and directors uh, commissioned a study about three years ago now called the Bartell Study. And in that study, we discovered that we didn't have enough young people to feed the, 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 the pipeline. We have a lot of agriculture-based companies in the North Central region. Mm -hmm. But we, who had, been, had a long history with 4-H, was not feeding the pipeline either. And so we felt that we could really begin to influence that agenda of helping young people understand the importance of agriculture in their everyday lives understanding the science behind agriculture and why that's important to feed in the world, as well as our everyday life, our lifestyle. I too discovered that agriculture, I needed agriculture to even think about my toothpaste. Hmm. And most of us don't make that connection of how basic agriculture is to our individual lives. And so the North Central program leaders decided that we would embark on the commodity challenge last year because we felt that that was one more way of helping young people understand agriculture in their life. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we felt that it was highly important. Very good. Again, telephone lines are open for you to join our conversation. Uh, our hour goes fast, so please don't wait too much longer. If you have a question or a comment, 877-731-6733. We have a caller on the line, and we're going to start out in Ohio, Dr. Paul. This is <laughs> Becky. Becky said, uh, our producer, she likes that name, Becky, so welcome. And you are up first. Great. Uh, well, I want to know how the teams serve as the facilitators and how are they utilized in the total program? How the teams? Okay. I think, Dr. P uh, Dorothy, you could. I think I would answer that question. Teenagers, we find young people who are experienced and have the skill to ask the questions. In Minnesota last year, they were late teens, 18 and 19, and, and some of them were even college students who understood the commodities and how you would ask young people's questions, as well as facilitating the process. And so they are well-trained, they are well-versed, they have good communication skills, they like to interact with young people, people and they like long hours and so <laughs> you, you tend to also have an adult nearby for just in case but most of the time they, they tend to manage it very very well. If someone, go, yes, Paul. Um, yeah, Becky, the other thing that we did last year and we're going to do this year as well is we gave uh, all the states uh, quite a few supporting materials mm -hmm. that would actually help the teens answer some of those challenging questions. When we had pork as a model last year, um, you know, there's always some concerns or challenges that may come up relative to how we raise animals. And so we provided, you know, the factual information that talks about all the good things that farmers are doing. We provided that to all the states. We put that together through the help of National 4-H so that we could facilitate an environment that the teens were educated, as Dorothy had said, and uh, knowledgeable about the information that they, they had to deliver and they felt confident about it. And right. That was important. Uh, Tim, if there's someone, it, thanks for the call, Becky. Uh, Becky's 4-H club, and they may want, may want to get involved. Uh, how would they go about getting more information about that? Getting more information about attending? About or working, being a volunteer uh, at one of the car uh, well, commodity if, carnivals. Well, if you're interested in where you can go to where those are going to be at, if you want to go to um, CME, www.cmegroup.com forward slash four, the number, mm -hmm. H, carnival, there's a listing on there of where all of the different locations are. Would you want to talk about if they are a 4-H member, how they could get involved? If they are a 4-H member and would like to volunteer and or participate in one of the North Central regions, they can go to their county and or state fair. In addition, they can learn more about it by 4-H, 4 h.org, go online and learn how to engage with their communities if they're interested in the 4-H program. Very good. Another caller on the line. Thanks for the call, Becky. We're going to go from Ohio to Michigan. Uh, this is Lori. Lori, welcome to our program. Hi. Thanks, Mark. Mm -hmm. I really like the game that you're talking about tonight because it's something that I've struggled with with my own students to explain markets and really make that simple. And it seems like that's what this game is doing. Do you have any materials for teachers or anything I could get my hands on to do this in my own classroom or maybe talk about the markets a little bit more? Wow. 
Well, you know, one of the resources that we have that uh, maybe for even a little bit older older kids and for you know adults that are trying to you know sort out the fundamentals of the market is we actually have a website called futuresfundamentals.com. Um, you know, explaining how markets work isn't always easy. You know, yeah. particularly when you start to talk about risk management products and and derivatives and things like that. So one of the things that we felt was really important mm -hmm. was to have a website that in very simple terms explained who's in the market, what they do in the market, what a futures contract is, what risk is. So, um, or I'd suggest that you, you uh, take a look at futuresfundamentals.com. Yeah, and I imagine it's, and you have all experienced this, where teachers, thanks for the call, Lori, uh, bring their classes out to play the game. Uh, what a great idea. Uh, she sounds like a teacher who's right on top of things, and I'm sure that's a very common scene at these county and state fairs. And you know, one, one of the other benefits of this, we've been talking a lot about the, the rural kids and their participation and understanding this. One of the benefits is the kids that come to the state fairs who aren't from a rural background. Hey, there you go. I mean, you know, where does food come from? Well, it comes from the, from the grocery store. Well, you know, I don't think they understand everything that goes into production. And I really don't think people understand the risk that producers have. I think they kind of have a picture that, well, you know, we go out and you know, we plant the crop and it always comes up and I always have a good price or, you know, mm -hmm. we feed the animals and I always make money doing it. It's not that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are years when producers have very tough years, when you have a drought or when markets are down. Um, and so we think it's important to help tell the story to that audience as well. Very good. All right, we're going to keep the phone lines coming. In fact, let me give the telephone number. You might be just joining us, either watching RFD TV or listening, Sirius XM Channel 80. The number is the same, and it's toll-free, 877-731-6733. Uh, as we uh, have Lori leave us, that leaves a line open for you. And we're going to go to uh, Illinois next. Uh, John, welcome to our program. Hey, thank you for uh, answering my phone call there. Um, I just had a quick question. Uh, it seems that the, the Commodity Carnival is a really big event and activity for kids to do, but what's the ultimate goal, let's say, in 10 years of the partnership with the National 4-H Council and the CME group? Like, is it to be in all 50 states and at the state fairs and things like that, or, or to reach as many youth uh, members across the country uh, with, through this Commodity Carnival? All right. Well, I can, I can answer that from the, the CME perspective. I mean, our goal is to, to grow the program in a way to, to be in the right sort of places um, so that, uh, you know, we can reach out to more people. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the Commodity Carnival is certainly something that's been very effective in that regard. I think mm -hmm. we're looking for, as, as Terry said in, in the video, a, a long-term educational effort to try to, um, through, through various different ways, mm -hmm. um, reach out to these kids, reach out to the community, and help them understand uh, production agriculture. And you know, thanks for the call, John, because you worked right into our next uh, topic. We knew we wanted to cover, uh, Tim, and that is, uh, yeah, the states that we cover in the North Central region, as Dr. Uh, Freeman has indicated, very important to 4-H, but anyone uh, because, again, the, the, the process as it continues with CME Group and 4-H, anybody in the country, no matter where you are listening or watching, can play the game online. You have an app for that. Yes, we do. <laughs> I mean, you know, we, we can't say that, uh, you know, that we're, we're not being progressive with this. And I have to tell you, um, I, I saw the app, and uh, I can't, I'll get the phone cranked up here. Um, I saw the app and started playing with it. And I got to tell you, this thing's a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, what it essentially is, it, it, there's an app for both um, iPhone and Android, and there's a computer version of this. And essentially what you do is you play something very similar to the game where you actually can have a herd of cattle. You can customize them. You can name them. Uh, somebody thought it was pretty funny. The first one, one of the first two was named Tim. Uh, yeah, well, somebody just made one mark today before dinner, so I'm in there too now. Uh, but, but you essentially go through and you make the same kind of decisions, and then you take your phone, and, and instead, of, instead of this thing sliding down, what you get to do is you get to play with your phone back and forth. Mm -hmm. And, by the way, I found out today that if you turn your phone upside down, it doesn't make the thing move the wrong direction. direction. Yeah, it's going to go down anyway. To, the markets continue to go forward. 
So uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic opportunity for you. I think we got a picture of it up here. Yeah, that's part of, uh, again, just uh, for those of you watching. And you can you see there where you put money into the various things, whether it's the farm, the feed, um, it, you know, you then have a starting value for your animal. Um, and then it goes know. through kind of that, that it Plinko drops through. Kind of can, <laughs> if you look here, some of these are red, and you can see when you hit a red one, um, red is risk. And ah, you can see that, that you, takes uh, away from your profits. Then takes Dr. away Paul. from your profits. Uh, the yellow, we just ah, oh, we got it. That's a coin, so that gives you a little bit more to invest the next year. Uh, whoever's playing this is doing a good job. Yeah, by they the way. are. Uh, I haven't seen them hit a red one yet. <laughs> I can tell you, it's a lot better than I did. Uh, and eventually, you get down here to the bottom of the farm. And I noticed the, that the land is green. It'll take you through all the seasons, which is that's <laughs> interesting, too. If we continue to play, that, that field behind would turn white, uh, i.e., in the wintertime. Correct. There's uh, four or, seasons. Or fall, and then winter, and then spring. And so you can see here now that on the right, this little F is the future shield. And so ah. that represents risk management. And uh, as, it, uh, as you drop it through again this time, if you look... When it gets to one of the red ones, what you see, you see right now there's a bit of a shield around it. And that, that represents the value of risk management. All right, very good. And with that, we're going to take a break. Dr. Paul, we're going to leave you, or you're going to leave us. Uh, and as we go to break, uh, any final thoughts you might want to leave with our viewers and listeners? Thank you for this what great game that you are bringing to uh, young people around them, rural America and uh, our young uh, adults from urban areas as well. Final thoughts? Well, the Ohio State University really is, is proud of what we were able to put together and, and uh, the partnership that we were able to uh, work with with National 4-H and CME Group. Um, I think the biggest thing is that we just need to teach consumers so that they can make educated decisions in the future. And this is an activity that starts those consumers at a pretty young age. And so we're starting to build that, uh, that understanding and trust in those young consumers. So I think it's pretty important. Great. Congratulations. Uh, and year number two is going to be a good one. Oh, will be, yes. Very good. <laughs> and with that, we're going to take our second and final break. Remember, phone lines are open, and the number toll-free is 877-731-6733. Call in with your questions. You can also go online, rfdtv.com slash live, and type in your questions. And as we go to break, another special message. This one, very special to uh, Dr. Dorothy uh, and uh, Freeman. This is our National 4-H Council President and and CEO Jennifer Sarangelo. Thank you so much for having me. The partnership between 4-H and CME Group just makes sense. 4-H is America's largest youth development organization and CME Group is the world's largest futures exchange company. Together, we're helping thousands of Americans understand the enormous value of agriculture and its impact on the economy. So we've produced the Commodity Carnival Game and Risk Ranch mobile app. These are interactive activities that show what it takes to feed our families and drive our economy. We're using fun and games to teach today's youth about agriculture and farming. As President and CEO of National 4-H Council, I'm so proud of our 4-Hers and pleased to partner with CME Group on this exciting program. One of the great aspects of this partnership is the Teens as Teachers model. In our more than 100 years in youth development, we found that when teens teach other young people, they develop a better understanding of the subject themselves. We'll be at over 100 county and state fairs this upcoming season, so hope to see you there playing Commodity Carnival. Welcome back to Rural America Live with our guests from the CME Group and 4-H. We've been talking about their partnership in this year's exciting Commodity Carnival coming a year two near you. At least uh, we have states around the north central region as it relates to uh, 4-H. In fact, Tim, let's talk a little bit about, again, that map. Maybe we can put the map up there, uh, Becky, and, and show uh, viewers and talk about that with listeners. Uh, this is in the central part of the country, and you are in how many state fairs and county fairs total? About 100? 120. 120. And they can go on to find out exactly in the states that we have here. They can go online to your website right. and, and get that information. Which is www.cmegroup.com forward slash four, the number four H carnival. 
And as we went to break, we had talked about the app you have uh, and uh, how that's just the age we live in. Uh, and to complete that, uh, how do, there, was a, there was an online question. They wanted to know, Mark, where do I get that app? Okay. Uh, the app is also at that website. It's not there yet. It will be coming soon. Uh, but uh, if you want to go to the website uh, and check it, that's where you'll be able to find the app. And the one thing that those people that are living outside the map that we that we showed right now to where we are, the 11 states, uh, the app is going to be available. They can play the game all year long. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's, uh, I, as I said, I tried playing this thing, and I'm, I'm a bit challenged to, to figure out how I'm going to, you know, get better and bigger cattle. So. Yeah. So not just the young 4-Hers, but uh, mom and dads could have some fun playing the game as well on the app, if yeah. not at the fair. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Freeman, the, the partnership between the 4-H and the CME group, we touched on that at the beginning of the program, but I, I don't know if we really, you had some more things you wanted to share, how important it is for you and other uh, members of the 4-H council like yourself around the country, how important this partnership is. Yeah, 4-H feels it's very important to help young people learn literacy, agriculture literacy. And we believe that we can take such programs nationally, not that they will be the same in every state, but that we could design programs to help young people learn about commodities, to help young people learn the issues related to, to agriculture, as well as help young people think about those issues, you know, man-made issues with man-made solutions. And when we do it that way, we really are using an engineering approach to helping young people gain those skills that our, our companies want them to have, critical thinking skills, problem solving skills. They say that um, they can teach young people how to do their, their job, but what they can't teach young people is how to have those critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, working with people different than themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's why 4-H thinks that it contributes to the partnership. Another online question real quick here, Tim, maybe uh, answer here, but how can we get a Commodity Carnival to come to our fair in Tennessee is the question. Tennessee's not in on Tennessee the map Tennessee right is now. not on the map. Well, um, you know, this year we're pretty well set right. in where we're coming to. Um, certainly I would uh, reach out to your local 4-H folks and uh, have them maybe do a little bit of lobbying to see if we can get there next year. Very good. Again, you can go online to the map to find out exactly where the county fairs or state fairs, uh, where the commodity carnival game will be and the schedule for events as well as you work through the summer. We have just a couple of minutes left here, uh, Dorothy, and uh, I want to start with you. Come down the line real quick, you and Tim, and uh, give you time as well as we did with Dr. Paul, some final thoughts. We are excited about being involved in this project is again is an example of young people as change agents that they help to change our public perception of what agriculture contributes to their lives and so the commodity challenge is a wonderful opportunity for our young people to do that as well and someone watching or listening that's not a 4-H member I think you'd have a recommendation for them I <laughs> would have a recommendation I would suggest that they join 4-H for far as I'm concerned it's the best youth development dollar that you could spend for your child and to go to 4-H or 4-H.org and look up 4-H in their local communities and join it you will not be disappointed well, we're not disappointed that you were here, and we certainly thank you for your input tonight. It's great to have you here. And thank you, Mark, for the opportunity. Come back and see us again. One minute left. Uh, Tim Andreessen, you have the final word. Great to have you with us again, and thanks for the great partnership with RFD-TV. Well, I can tell you when it comes to not disappointed, CME is not disappointed that we had this phenomenal opportunity to work with 4-H. You know, CME's been around for a long time mm -hmm. in, in our various exchanges. We're a, we're a name known in the agricultural community. 4-H is, is as well, probably more known than us, and it's a phenomenal partnership. It's a great opportunity for us to benefit the kids, but also communicate about risk management, and we're really excited to have that opportunity. Very good, and happy anniversary, 50 years, live cattle futures trading at the CME Group. So We've been around. We uh, actually, I think it was two years ago, we had 135 years of futures trade. All right. Very good. And with that, Commodity Carnival. Have a great summer. I'm Mark Offald. Thank you so much for joining us. From all of us, CME Group and 4-H, good night.